Good morning. My name is Arthur Karabot, and today I'm going to be talking about high-performance WebView user interfaces. So uh, this is where you're going to be using a WebView to build your audio UI, and the requirements are maybe a little juicy. You've got to build something that's a bit more than just a couple of parameters, and so performance is a concern. I am a senior software engineer at Output. We're a music tech company based in California, and today's talk is going to be told through a case study of a product that we currently have in public beta called Output Creator. Output Creator is a DAW aimed at people who are new to making music with a computer, and it's built using a web view. So when we're talking about performance, we're talking about rendering a scene like this, and I've got this little stress test video that I use for testing the rendering performance, where this renders thousands of uh, events on the screen, each with waveforms and text and that sort of thing, and it simulates a number of user interactions. And this is running on a 2020 13-inch MacBook Pro connected to a 4K monitor. So it's a nippy little machine, but it's four years old at this point. And we can see with the average rendering of these things, to render an entire frame, which is rendering everything from scratch, takes about five milliseconds on the average case, which you could translate to 200 frames per second if the monitor could handle that. In a more realistic case, we're looking at a 60 frames per second screen. And so what that actually means is we have this amount of headroom left per frame to work with. So let's talk about rendering this scene and what technologies you would use uh, when you are using a web view to create this kind of thing. Um, the two primary things uh, are the DOM and the canvas. So the DOM is, stands for the Document Object Model. And it sort of looks like this. It's kind of using HTML elements like sections, buttons, labels, inputs, etc. And you can create this either using HTML or you can do it procedurally using JavaScript. Whereas Canvas code um, looks a bit more like this. It's using more primitive graphics rendering calls. And the Canvas is really what you want to reach for when performance is a concern. It's the kind of thing that's used behind big web apps. So Google Sheets uses this, for example. And yeah, it's really what you want to reach for with performance. Today's talk is going to be in three sections, primarily going to be talking about the canvas, um, but a little bit more about the DOM, and then layering uh, the DOM and the canvas over the top of each other. So the canvas. The canvas is just an HTML element. And when you create one of them, you get a graphics rendering context. Those contexts come in a few different flavors. So there's a 2D context. There are a couple of WebGL ones, WebGL 1 and 2. And then there's the newer WebGPU one. Today, I'm actually going to be focusing on the 2D context, and that is because it has this pretty friendly API, which lo should look familiar to anyone who's used something like the Juice graphics running context, but it's also hardware accelerated. So all the modern browsers will use your GPU when available to do this rendering, and that's what makes them very quick. Like any engineering decision, the, we're making a trade-off when we decide to use the canvas. The things we gain compared to the DOM are performance and control, control over how we're rendering things, when we're rendering them. The things that we lose are the immediate access to the CSS layout engines, the animation engines, the off-the-shelf interactive elements like buttons, and the off-the-shelf accessibility. These are all things that can be addressed, and I'll go into some of those a little bit later. So talking about rendering things quickly, I really like this quote from the game dev developer Mike Acton, where he said, it's very unlikely in any given situation that one thing exists in a vacuum. The most common case is I have multiple, so I may as well transform them together. Now, in this talk, Mike is talking about transforming data updates to state, and he's talking about the performance penalties you get when you have cache misses. But this same principle applies to rendering. Let's see how. I'm going to take this scene, so rendering a whole bunch of events, and I'm going to walk you through two ways of rendering this the difference is that one is much faster, is in twice as fast than the other. The unfortunate thing is that when we see a scene like this, we often opt for the slow way of doing this. Um, there's a bit of pattern matching that happens in our brain. We see a scene like this and we go, ooh, look at that. Lots of little things that are very similar with slight differences. I know I could write a function or a class that would render one of these, and then I'll add some parameters to get those variations. Unfortunately, as this turns out, it's the slower approach. So I'm calling this individual rendering, and I'll just outline that very quickly. It's where you would write a function like render event, and then you'd have a loop over all of your event data, and you would call render event on each of those. So visually, it looked like this. You render one event, you render the second, the third. This one's got a bit of selection on it, the fourth, fifth. Eventually, all of them for the first track, the second, the third, the fourth. 
The much faster way of doing this is batch rendering. And I'll start with visually, it looks like this. We render the background for all of the pink events on the first track, then the background for all of the second track, the third, the fourth. And then in one fell swoop, we do the borders for every single event. And this is because they all have the same visual properties. They've all got the same color, they've all got the same line width. Then all of the waveforms, then all of the text, all of the handles for resizing them, all of these little icons, and finally the selected portions. And we layer all of these and we get the exact same scene. So this code looks a little bit different, and I'll come back to this in a bit, but um, it tends to look like one big inline function and four different sections. Again, I'll come back to it. But if we look at the results, we can see that the fast version is 2.2 times faster. And that's just for the uh, JavaScript uh, portion of the code. If we actually look at what the GPU is doing, we've got a really short amount of work here. But on the slower version, it's actually taking up the entire frame which means for rendering the exact same scene, the slow version can start dropping frames, which is really not what we want for a good user experience. So why is this? Why is the faster version faster? Well, these graphics rendering contexts are a lot like us developers. They're really good when they're focused on a single task and they're not being interrupted. What do I mean by interruptions for a graphics rendering context? Well, it's when you're changing the thing that you're doing. So for example, setting the fill style. In the slow version, we might need to change between fill styles as we go over the different events. So going from pink to blue, back to pink. And it's actually easy to understand why this uh, is less performant, because we can just look at the, in this case, Chrome source code to see what happens when you call fill style. This 64 line of code C++ function gets called. Now lines of code isn't a um, rock solid measurement of what the performance be. I'm using it here as a useful heuristic because in, not all of these lines of code will be called and some can be more expensive than other, but this does turn out to be a useful heuristic. So another example is that in the slow version, we are calling fill multiple times, one for each of these events, just to draw the background. In the fast approach, we're calling fill once for all of the backgrounds. And again, this fill method is a 91 line of code method in C++. And if we do a quick bit of maths and take the slow version for 1,000 events versus the fast version for 1,000 events, we see we've got 289,000 lines of C++ potentially being evaluated and 133 in the faster version. If uh, you work the ratio out between those, it's 2.17. If you remember the performance speed up that we saw before, it turns out this is a fairly useful heuristic. But we don't actually need to look at the C++ code, even though it is a good thing to do, and it's all there for you to take a look at, to understand uh, this performance difference. One way to see it is to take the slow version of the code and inline it. So if you remember, it looked something like this. We had a render event function and then a loop. So if we were to inline this for two events, um, this render event function, the first two things it does are calculate the bounds of the event, just the rectangle that it sits in, and then draw the background. If we inline this for two events, unroll the loop, if you will, we can see we've got the bounds and the background for the first, and the bounds and the background for the second. If we just focus in even on the background rendering of these two, I put this up here, and I'm sure every developer's brain is going, look at all that repetition, we should make this dry, and you know, this, these lines of code are being repeated. And you're right, and both the fast, fast and the slow versions are reducing this duplication down to a single line. The difference is that in the slow version, you've got one line of code that is executed many times, and in the fast version, you've got one line of code that is executed once. So moving this forward into the fast path, it would look like this. We call the lines that are repeated, begin path, fill style, and fill only once. And the things that are specific to the individual events, they happen uh, once per event. At this point, we could re-roll the code back into a loop, and we get this, which starts to look like our fast version of the code. And I'm going to jump into a little bit more detail of um, what this looks like. That trick of inlining code is really useful for finding performance optimizations. If you encounter some code that is slow and you're having to refactor it, it's a really great way to approach doing that. So this fast version of the code, I tend to find that it follows a pattern of these four sections. The first thing that you do is to create a number of paths. And anyone's not familiar with a path, it's just an object which contains a, an array of, well, a number of geometries. So you can say, add a rectangle to it, add a circle and some lines, and you can draw them all together. 
So we create a number of those. And the second thing we do is any shared calculations, calculations which are going to apply to all of our events in this case. Um, the third thing is to loop over all of our event data and do any calculations that are specific to those events, turn them into geometries which we add to the path. And the fourth is to finally actually take those paths and render them, put them on the screen. So looking at the production code uh, from the demo that I showed at the beginning, these are all of the paths that are created to render the events. You can see there's quite a few here, some of them individual, some of them are maps, you know, mapping the track ID to the paths. The second is where we do shared calculations. And as I said, these are things that are applied. This is a nice performance speed up because you end up doing these calculations once, where when you're taking the slow approach, you can sort of forget the larger context of what you're doing and do them on every single event. These might be trivial. There might be things like how many pixels are we using per beat, and that's based on the zoom level. But they could also be things that are less trivial, like the voice Y position. Many of the events are going to end up on the same Y position. This might be non-trivial because some voices can be expanded and resized, or they might be hidden. And so in these cases, once we do calculate one of them, we can cache that value and store it to reuse for the other events. Third section is to do this looping over the events. And this is where we, like I said, we do any calculations that are specific to the events, the exact bound positions, and we add to each of these geometries. In this case, we add a rounded rectangle to this path called all bounds path. Finally, the last thing we do is actually render them. And so you can see here, I'm rendering the waveforms path. This is the waveform for every single event, the thousands of events you saw on screen once. And what it means is because these all have the same stroke style and the same line width, we only end up calling those functions once, and then we draw the entire path. So that was this principle of thinking about um, your rendering living in a bigger context, not in a vacuum of a single event applied to the canvas. We can see how the same thing applies to the DOM, which is the other, other technology that I'm using to build this interface. If you remember the UI that I showed at the beginning, there's this list of samples on the left. And this was actually built using the DOM because it's the right set of trade-offs to use uh, for this part of the UI. It's not something that changes very often. It actually only changes when the user switches track, which is something that you do sort of once you know, uh, every few minutes, perhaps. Or you're not doing this every second or many times a second. So when I switch to the second track, this list of samples changes. Now, the important thing to remember with the DOM is one of the times when the DOM is slow is when you change the layout of your page and the browser has to recalculate the position of everything and re-render them on the screen. And it, it would do that if you do something like delete this first element from the list. If I were to remove that element, everything else would have to shift up. The browser is going to recalculate it all. The much faster way to do this is, again, think of the bigger context that these events don't happen in a vacuum. They're all happening together. So you construct a new list off screen and then you add it to the page once it's all ready. So in this case, we create a list element, so OL it means ordered list. Then we loop over all of the information, all the data for our samples, construct those elements, add them to the list. And then crucially, we only add the list to the document, make it visible once at the end. And that's when the browser is going to uh, do all the layout calculations and re-render it. If you really want to make sure this is synced with um, the browser's rendering, you would also wrap this in a request animation frame. Now, these layouts uh, are just one of the things that can make the DOM slow. Unfortunately, there's a long list of them. Um, there are many things that can make the DOM slow. There's a great document by Paul Irish. It's on GitHub that lists these out, and it's worth paying attention to. Final section I'm going to talk about today is layering. And what I mean by layering is taking HTML elements, which might include the canvas, and putting them over the top of each other. And this can be for performance or also to gain back some of those trade-offs that I mentioned at the beginning when you're using the canvas. So if you remember the UI, uh, we have all of these events on the screen. We also have this playhead. Now, the playhead is something that changes rapidly. When you're playing, this is moving continuously. And in this case, the text that's attached to it also needs to be updated. We can get a performance uh, boost here by separating out this rendering into two separate canvases. So I'll create one, which has all of our events on it, and the second, which has a transparent background, which has the playhead on it. And what this means is the, all the times when the user is not interacting with the system, where they're just listening to their uh, track, the playhead can be re-rendering, but the events don't need to at all. So in code, it looks like something like this. We've got two canvases. They've got different z-indexes. 
So it means one's on top of each other, or the other. And visually, it would be like this. We've got the first canvas, and in front of it, we've got the second. And you could take this further, you know, the numbers and the grid background, that could also be on a, a separate canvas. You really want to look at, again, the bigger context of what you're rendering and when. Layering these elements isn't just limited performance uses, as I said. You can also use this to get back some of the, say, interactive off-the-shelf HTML elements. So text editing is something that would be a real pain to implement yourself using um, just a, uh, using a canvas. So in a case like this, where you want to rename one region, what you can actually do here is when the user double clicks, just create a single text editing field lay that over the top of the canvas in the correct position, and you've got back some of that nice uh, interactivity, saving yourself a real headache. Similar things can be done with accessibility, for example, um, with invisible DOM elements where needed. So, in conclusion, if there's only one thing that you take away from this talk, if there's only one word that you would remember, it would just be batch. But if we think about this with a, a little more context, if we come back to the quote we had at the beginning, it's very unlikely in any given situation that one thing exists in the vacuum. And I think the slightly more abstract version of this is to think about the broader context in which you're rendering. What is the common case and what are you really doing? So this means that you might want to batch things when think they have the same visual properties because you can put them all together. You may want to batch things when they change at the same time. But you actually may want to separate your rendering out entirely where it's appropriate. So this playhead example, we can separate those two things and great, get a great performance boost. There might be other times that you want to separate things, when you have multiple layers of events that perhaps don't change at the same time. So really, the big takeaway should be consider the full context of what you're doing from um, a, a first principles approach, and you can really uh, get much better rendering performance. Hope you found today's talk useful. If you have, I'm working on a book with this, uh, with the audio program is here. And uh, you can find a sign-up form to get uh, a mailing list, very low volume, um, so you can find out when that book's coming out, and also slides from today's talk at this link, or that QR code. Thank you.